Let's talk about Advent. That's what we're here for. Uh, this is going to be an hour or less. Um, you can certainly ask questions, like if you want to interrupt, that's totally fine. Um, the people at home won't mind. <laughs> um, so Advent is the season that we are we have just we have just entered. It started on December the first with Sunday, and it goes through uh, Christmas Eve. Um, and some of you are from traditions in which Advent is practiced, and some of you are from traditions in which Advent is not practiced. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to talk about the purpose of Advent, give you some of the history of Advent, and some of the ways in which a person might practice Advent uh, if they wanted to do so, um, without trying to lay any kind of law on y'all, right? So um, that's what I'm going to do. So let's start with what Advent uh, is about. Uh, Advent is about darkness. Right? Advent is about darkness. Advent is this period of darkness that ends with the coming of the Christ child. And so um, Advent begins with, with, a, with a darkness that hopefully lightens a bit as you get closer to Christmas. But Christmas is the coming of that light. Um, ancient people um, fasted and then feasted. We feast all the time. And we don't have a we don't have an understanding of Americans don't have an understanding of fasting and then feasting. Like you know, in the Bible it says like we're going to kill the fatted calf, and that's the big feast. That's what McDonald's sells. Okay, is fatted calves. I'm not kidding. Like fatty. Fatty meat is what you can eat for a dollar right after this is over. You know, you can drive over to McDonald's and you can, get, you can eat the fatted calf. That's how much we, we feast. Um, but the ancient world, um, the pre-modern world, where food was uh, something that wasn't always readily available, and we didn't have just tons of it all over the place, um, there was fasting before feasting for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is because you literally didn't have the food because you were saving it up. And you had to save up that food until you could eat it at the feast time. So you had to kind of back off before you could have a lot. Advent is a t time like that, a time of fasting as we prepare um, for the time of feasting. Um, now, the, the world, and I'm not, look, I'm not Scrooge, Scrooge over here. I, I don't care what people do. Um, with, them, with their lives. But the world, our society, feasts, like I say, all the time, but they especially feast in this time period, the time period leading up to Christmas. And the time after Christmas is sort of the like zoned out hangover time, you know, where nothing is happening in that week between Christmas and New Year's because everyone's just like, you know, and everyone's spent all their money. Um, Usually on credit cards, but whatever. So, so the world has this is their, this is their advent, right? Is the is the is the pre gaming, right? Is the feasting, feasting, feasting up till Christmas Day. So much so that, um, in my experience of living that way, um, Christmas is like a real letdown because you're like building up, and there's really once you get there, it's like, oh, well, that was stupid because you've already. Had so much uh, tremendousness. Um, Christian Advent, the, this December period uh, for us, um, is a time not is a time of not only of fasting because we're supposedly saving up the food and the money for Christmas, but also it's a time of fasting in a spiritual sense. Um, and part of part of that is the, like allowing the void in ourselves, and part of it is allowing ourselves to identify with the poor. Um, part, of the, part of Advent is about repentance. Repentance, um, in, the, in the Old Testament especially, most of the time when the people were called to repent is because of the way they treated the poor. They disobey God, and the main evidence of that is you don't give justice to the poor. And so, in preparation for the coming of the Christ child, we spend some time identifying with the poor. Part of the way we do that is through a, a 
physical fasting, part of the way we do that is through spiritual fasting. Um, and the fact that Christ's family is poor is part of that Advent thing. We know that Jesus' family was poor. And the reason we know Jesus' family was poor is because of what they sacrificed in the temple uh, when, he, when they made an offering for his birth. Uh, you may not know this, you probably do, that um, whenever you have a, a child born, you go in the, or male child born, you get circumcised, you make an offering, and the amount you offer was based on how much money you have. And the poorest people could offer a pigeon, which is what Jesus' family offered. So we know that he was... Now, um, who needs Advent, <laughs> right? Uh, everybody needs Advent. The poor need Advent, and the rich need Advent. Um, the attractive need Advent, and the unattractive need Advent. The, 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 the old and the young. Because all of us need um, space. For a, we need a fasting space before we have a feasting space. And so Advent is a reminder of that. Right? So, um, Let's talk about the history of Advent, shall we? And, oh, is this the one? Yeah. And I saw this painting in real life just a couple months ago. Freaky! Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Okay. So let's talk about, um, let's, let's start where, um, where Advent uh, begins. Advent begins when the church begins to talk about the birth of Jesus as a date. Now, the church, from the very beginning, we celebrated Easter. Uh, specifically, we celebrate Easter every Sunday. When we were like, oh, that's our day of resurrection. And very quickly in the history of the church, we started celebrating Easter on a specific date, and, you know, around Passover. Like that was our thing. But the more we got pagan, the more pagans like joined our, our club, the more people started thinking about not only Jesus' resurrection, but his birthday. Uh, birthdays are not a Jewish idea. Like, the Jewish people did not, Middle Eastern people did not celebrate birthdays. That was not a thing. Okay? But pagans, European pagans, did celebrate birthdays. Like a birthday was a big deal. And so you come into this religion and you're like, hey, let's celebrate Jesus' birthday. So what is Jesus' birthday? Well, this guy, Sextus Julius Africanus, um, was a historian. He was a church historian, and he was tasked by the Pope to try to figure out um, the, the dates of the date of creation. And so what he did was he backed up creation from history, right, and everything else, and he, uh, he, he, and he got to the place where he assumed that um, he, his, he figured out what he thought was the, the date of the Annunciation, and therefore nine months after the Annunciation is Jesus' birthday. Right? So he's the guy who decided that Jesus was born on December the 25th, year one. Now, which is absurd, right? Because Jesus was had to have been born before 6, 8, 6 BC. Right? Because Herod is dead by 6 BC, and Herod can't hunt him down if he's dead. And so Jesus was born <laughs> about 7 BC-ish. Okay. But that's what Sextus Julius Africanus came up with in, in 220 AD. Now, you know that uh, this did, did not strike everybody well. Uh, Origen, the church father from Alexandria, who was kind of a freak, but uh, Origen condemned the idea of Christmas. And that's actually how we know that Christmas was being celebrated. For the, okay, It's because Sextus comes up with, in 220, he's like 25th of December, and then 25 years later, Origen is like, we have to stop the horrible pagan idea of celebrating the birth of Jesus. Like, this is ridiculous. Birthdays are you know, obscene. We're not doing this. Okay? Um, so 245 AD, he proclaims that. Now, in 274 AD, the Romans invent a holiday called Sol Invictus, right? the unconquered sun. And you will hear um, people in the world say things like, oh, Christians took the Roman holiday and just put Jesus' birthday on it. Not true. In fact, the Romans took the Christian holiday and put Sol Invictus on it. Now, look, there's a ton of stuff in Christmas that's totally pagan. All right? Like, totally pagan. That's just not one of them. So, 
Sol Invictus 274 is when it was proclaimed by the emperor, uh, and it seems to be because the Christian celebration of Christmas was becoming a big deal, and Roman pagans were like, well, we want to have a party too. You know, and so, and so they have the party. By about 380 AD is when the Christian calendar was pretty much in its final state. Uh, and by that time, there was a period of Advent leading up to Christmas. And the period of Advent um, was different depending on what region you lived in, like where you lived. Sometimes Advent was like a six-week-long thing, and sometimes it was a 40-day-long thing. But eventually, by about the 500s, you have an Advent that is four Sundays long, and it's the four Sundays preceding Christmas. Christmas is its, If Christmas falls on a Sunday, it is not Advent. So, it's, so Advent is shorter or longer depending on where the Sundays fall. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, that's how we get to dates. Um, okay, so like I said, if you're unfamiliar with the, with the Christian calendar, we, there, are, there, are, like I say, there are four Sundays in Advent. The first Sunday of Advent is the beginning of Advent, and it is also the beginning of the Christian year. Uh, the Christian year begins with the first Sunday of Advent. So, Happy New Year to you all, because December 1st for us this year, 2019, was the, the, first, the first Sunday of the, the Christian year. That's when our, our lectionary calendars begin. On that day, um, that's when the day the, well, used to, the daily office would start from the beginning of that day. Now it's by the calendar year, whatever. Um, and so, yes, that's, that's, that's the beginning of our year, is that, is that occasion. And which makes sense, because Advent is, of course, about, well, I'm going to talk about what it's about in a second. Okay, so Christmas Day is the first day of Christmas. Christmas lasts for 12 days. So it lasts from the 25th of December uh, until the 5th, the evening of the 5th of January. That's called Twelfth Night, is the, the 5th of January. All right. And then the next day, the 6th of January, is Epiphany. Um, and then that's when the Epiphany season starts, and the Epiphany season goes until Ash Wednesday. Um, so the, the idea here is that we have four Sundays, or four weeks approximately, worth of fasting, preparing for 12 days of raucous partying. That's the idea. Right? So we're supposed to be getting nuts beginning on a Christmas day. Like the 12, you know, 12 days of Christmas is not about the 12 days that lead up to Christmas, unlike what the car commercials say, it's the 12 days beginning with Christmas, right? So, all right. Um, so from early days, um, Advent was called Advent because of the Latin word, and you're going to hate my church pronunciation rather than my classic pronunciation, Adventus, right? Um, Adventus is the church Latin word for coming, right? And so Jesus is coming, that's what we called it. Pretty simple, right? It's like the beginning of every, um, the, the name of most of the books of the Old Testament are just, or either the name of the guy who supposedly wrote it, or just the first couple words, right? <laughs> like Genesis means in the, uh, in the big, right? Okay, so in the East, the Advent is called the Nativity Fast, right? The fast before the Nativity, which is, I think, a, probably a better term because it tells us what to do. Um, it's sometimes it's called uh, the Lesser Lent or the Winter Lent because. Lent and Advent are very similar, um, are, are very similar times, um, because they're both about fasting, they're both about preparation, they're both um, about like what is going to happen at the end of them, but it, but you go through some the darkness until you get to that time. I mean, it's no coincidence that Advent is at this time of year when the days get darker every day, right? every single day the days are getting darker and darker and darker. Like this is the this is the darkest time of year in that sense. Um, obviously, once the twenty second happens, days begin to get brighter, um, and so it's like, oh look, things are getting more hopeful. Or whatever. And you can imagine, like, if you were per an ancient person, that um, especially like an ancient sun worshiper or whatever, it would scare the you know the holy heck out of you 
that it was, the things were getting darker, that the sun was getting lower in the sky, and you had to like pray that he would go back up, you know. Um, but that's what Advent is like. It's this time, like I mentioned in my sermon, I'm talking about my sermon a little bit, it's a time of fear, right? because darkness is fearful to us. Right? Um, anyway, so that's why we call it, that's why we call it that, coming, or the lesser light, or the winter light. Um, okay, there's three, the, so Advent is a time of preparation. All fasting is preparation. Um, What's it preparation for? It's a preparation for three things. The first is the second coming of Christ. And the purpose of Advent is to prepare us for the second coming. Jesus says many times in the New Testament, in, in the Gospels, that we should be prepared for him for his return. He talks about, like, you know, be awake. Um, don't waste your time in drunkenness and, dis and dissipation. You know, like all these warnings and warnings and warnings about being awake, being alert, uh, being prepared, like there was, he has lots of, of um, parables about this, the parable of the ten virgins, etc. Like, be prepared. So Advent is the time when the church is like, this is an important aspect of, of Christianity. Like, this is the thing we do in Advent, as we prepare ourselves, and we're preparing ourselves for the second coming. Because that's the thing that is going to happen. And that's and when Jesus is prophesying and telling us to be prepared, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the second coming. He's not talking about the first coming, because that one's already done, right? Let's talk about the second coming. And we're also preparing for the Feast of the Incarnation. So, um, and in fact, it, the, the readings, the lectionary readings, begin in Advent as apocalyptic, like extremely apocalyptic. You know, like sky's turning to blood, the moon is falling out of the sky, you're all going to, like, in, in definite danger of hellfire. And then it shifts over the time to being about the incarnation, to being about uh, Mary and about Joseph and everything else. In the middle there is John the Baptist, so start, it always starts with like Revelation stuff, and then John the Baptist, and then Mary and Joseph. Okay. And even when it does that, it's still apocalyptic, because the things that John the Baptist say are almost always apocalyptic. Like he's an apocalyptic prophet. And the things that Mary says are all apocalyptic. Right? The Song of Mary is this apocalypse. Right? Because it's about the end of the world. You know, the Song of Mary is not about like, yeah, I get to have a baby. Right? It's about like, the world's going to end. The poor, the poor are going to rule. The rich are going to burn. Woohoo! You know, like that's the, 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 where she's going. You know, as uncomfortable as that is. Um, and so this, so, be, so you know, you got Mary and Joseph and everything else, but it's an apocalypse throughout. Uh, and finally, of course, Advent is about wakefulness and preparation for the coming of Christ in our daily lives. Right? Because Jesus shows up in, in our life, not just once when he was incarnated, and then once when he's going to return. But there's all kinds of a, uh, his daily Advent, you know. Um, that's a, from the Book of Common Prayer, his daily visitation. And so that's one of the things we're preparing for also, is that is that daily visitation. Uh, okay, questions or comments about anything I just said before I hit the customs of Advent? Excellent, you're buying this stuff, that's amazing. Okay, because I'm just making this up completely. <laughs> None of this is real, I'm just kidding. All right, so customs of Advent. So how has the church celebrated Advent? Well, one thing we've done is we've chosen a color for Advent because we, are, we like to be color coordinated with our seasons, and purple is the color of Advent. Um, purple is the color of, in the church, is the color of both penance and royalty. And you think that doesn't make any sense because why would, like, how do those two things go together? Well, if you're royal, obviously you're not penitent when you're in purple. That's the color of your, like, royal robes. It's like uh, Tyrian purple. Tyrian purple was the most expensive dye in the ancient world because it was taken from these little fish, you know, and you could just like, you could go a little tiny bit from each of these like puffer fishers or whatever they were. Um, and so it's very, very, very expensive to have Tyrian purple. So if you had a robe of Tyrian purple, you were super rich, right? And in fact, the Romans for, um, forbade people who weren't royal at one point to wear the Tyrian purple. So Tyrian purple is the color, okay? 
But so the king is wearing Tyrian purple. So why are why is it about pendants? Well, because you're not the king, <laughs> right? So here comes the guy in purple, and you better hit the ground with your face in the dirt. Right? So when you see purple, it's not because you're royal, I'm royal, it's because Jesus is royal. And here he comes, and oh blank, you know, oh expletive, here comes Jesus. Because Jesus is the king, and therefore is terrifying. Like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And he's terrifying, because he is the king of the universe, and his eyes are like burning poles and all this kind of stuff. And so you like, ah! Hit the ground. That's why. So that's what purple is there to tell you. It's like the king is coming. So watch out. Okay? That's your that's your symbol. Um, there is this thing that the Anglo Catholics like called the Sauron Missile, and in it, um, Advent is blue rather than purple. I think that's silliness. Okay, but I have to tell you because I'm a good person that you could have blue, and you sometimes see it. Uh, for uh, and then there's also something called Gaudete Sunday, which is the pink Sunday. There's a, there's a, the third Sunday of Advent is a special, like, hey, let's just chill out on this Sunday and, like, maybe eat a little extra, maybe have a bite of ice cream or whatever. That's the, that's Gaudete Sunday. It's in the, the third of uh, Advent. There's also uh, another pink Sunday of the year. It's the fourth uh, Lent. The fourth Sunday of Lent is a pink Sunday. So, I don't have any pink robes. <laughs> so if you're thinking about spending any money and you want to buy some pink for the church, we would wear it twice a year. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't, please don't spend money on that. All right. <laughs> All right, colors. Uh, the Advent wreath is a, something that we do, and in fact, something that um, a lot of people do in their homes. Um, the Advent wreath begins in Northern England in the sense that wreaths began in Northern England. Wreaths are a pagan symbol of fertility and therefore of eternal life. I'm not going to explain in what way they're a fertility symbol, but you can probably figure it out. Um, so they're fertility and eternal life. And then you put candles on them, right? And then you have a fiery symbol of fertility and you know eternal life, which is awesome and super pagan and therefore great. So you can imagine pagans with like a crown of greenery with candles in them and stuff like this. And Shakespeare has some of this in his in his plays. Has these this sort these sorts of images. Okay, these are prefiguring the kind of stand, now standardized Advent wreath. These were not standardized. These were just something that people did. Okay, um, we actually know the dude who invented the Advent wreath. Right, he's this dude. Johann Hinrich Vicker, right? He invented the Advent wreath in 1830. He was a Protestant. Uh, he was a low church Lutheran and an evangelist. And he was trying to come up with a way of teaching Advent to the people. And so he was like, here's what I'll do. I'll have four candles on a wreath, and you light one on first Sunday, two on the second Sunday, three on the third Sunday, four on the fourth Sunday, and a big white candle in the middle, and that's the Christmas candle, and we'll let that burn for 12 days. That's what an Advent wreath is, right? Invented by a German. You can understand, then, if you have these, like, non-standard wreaths, and then, of course, it's a German who's like, no, no, we must standardize. <laughs> like, maybe everybody do the same thing, okay? So it's not a Catholic tradition, it's a, it's a German Lutheran tradition, originally. And, like, most of our Christmas traditions, it was imported to the United States by uh, German Lutherans when they immigrated over here. Like almost everything you do for Christmas is because of German Lutherans. Right. So um, it's about the coming coming of light, right? I said that Advent is a season of darkness. So you start Advent with just one candle lit. You have five candles, but only one of them is lit, right? And then as the as the month goes by, you have increasing light, and then the Christmas candle is the big white one in the middle, which is supposed to burn for twelve days. And that is to say, like, oh, look, now Christmas is here. Um, now, there, recently, I have noticed that um, evangelicals have been using Advent wreaths, but they put words on their Advent wreaths, like joy and hope and all this stuff. Right? And this is because, as a general rule, Protestants are, are, do not like symbols that don't have words with them. Because it makes them, 
it makes them uh, uncomfortable. Okay, so you got to have a words on them. There are no words associated with the four with when you know with the admin brief. Okay, that's just something that someone made up recently. Okay, and those are not the themes of Advent, right? Love, joy, peace, and whatever hope. Those aren't the themes of Advent. The, the themes of Advent traditionally are death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Okay, so the third Sunday of Advent is the Heaven Sunday, hence the pink candle. Okay, death, judgment, both purple, pink, heaven, purple, hell. Which means that it, traditionally you're talking about hell the Sunday before Christmas, which is a terrible time to preach on hell. Because that's when people actually show up for church and never come, and they're like, now it's all I got to talk about is hell. And you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. No, it's just that one Sunday, and you can show them on it. Okay, so those are the traditional, those are the traditional themes of Advent. I have never seen an Advent wreath that said death, judgment, heaven, and hell. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so you should make one up. Um, okay. The hell of a one. So, um, Lessons and Carols is something that you may have heard. If you've not seen Lessons and Carols, it's, it's broadcast on Christmas Eve from Westminster Abbey, and you should definitely uh, see it sometime. Um, there's a, a, some churches that can pull it off, can pull off some really gorgeous Lessons and Carols. Um, the best is probably the one up in Swanee, right, up at the, the chapel in Swanee, which is like the biggest Anglican church in the entire state. But there it is, it's the chapel. Um, St. George's pulls off a pretty okay one. The, um, cathedral. the cathedral pulls off a great one. Yeah. So those are some great lessons and carols. This is a purely Anglican thing. Like we made this one up. Right? And it was invented by this guy named Archbishop Benson in 1880. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to have a, um, a great vigil of Easter, but for Christmas. Okay. So, just let you know. So the great vigil of Easter is a very long service that is supposed to end with sunrise on Easter morning. Okay? And it um, has a number of traditional lessons, and it involves music in between the lessons, and there's baptisms, and you celebrate Eucharist as the sun rises. That's the great vigil of Easter. Historically, it lasted all night long. Like, literally all night long. You start when the sun goes down, and you're done when the sun comes up, like 12 hours or whatever. Um, now it's shorter, for sure. Uh, and ben, but Benson wanted a Christmas version. He wanted something that you did the night before Christmas that led into Christmas like um, like the Great Vigil did. And so he invented um, Lessons and Carols. So there's nine traditional lessons um, that are read. And then there's, you can have as many carols as you want. And about, ninth, about the end of World War I was when they, those were kind of all finalized and were done. Um, so you know what the lessons are. Okay. So anyway, those are some of the ways that the church practices Advent um, as, a, as a general rule. Like, obviously, Sunday mornings, our worship is different. Our worship on Sundays is very similar, though not specifically like, exactly like um, our Lenten service. So it's super penitential. Here, for instance, we, we start with the, the reading of the law, right, which is the purpose of reading you the law so that you'll repent. So you hear the law and you go like, oh, no, I didn't do that. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, most of us at 1045 service are not there in the room when that happens. And so because of that, some of the 1045 service, a lot of them are having less penance in Lent or in Advent or before Lent than they normally would. But whatever, you know, I don't judge. Um, <laughs> live and let live, man. Come as you are. Uh, it's totally fine. So anyway, we do that and we have, it's more penitential liturgical stuff. Though it is not exactly, obviously, like that. So there are differences on Sunday morning um, as well. Um, all right. Any questions about the history or the practice of Advent in, uh, in the communities, like church-wise? Because I'm about to get into personal practices of Advent. That's what I'm about, what I'm about to do. You said that Westminster is broadcast? Mm -hmm. in the Westminster Cathedrals, yes. Where, where, where is it? NPR? Right. Um, yeah. yeah, Christmas Eve. Okay. It's in the afternoon, I think. Yeah, it happens, it happens there, at, you know, around towards midnight. But here, it happens, yeah, in the, there's seven hours or six hours off or whatever it is. Wow. Okay. 
from us. So you can you can listen to it. You can probably find it on YouTube too. I guarantee you can find it on YouTube. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. But you really should, like, if you can, like, go to Swanee or go to the cathedral downtown or whatever. Like, it's it's totally worth seeing. Yes, sir. Do you buy your Advent wreath somewhere, or do you make it? I make mine. So you just find some lovely pine. Yeah. Pieces. I, I I I get I get three purple and one pink candle. I don't like scented candles, so it's hard to find, but I do find them. And then I get one white candle, and I just put the, the I just put the purple ones and the pink one like a cross, like if you're looking at from above, right, or like a square. And I put the white one right in the middle, and then I get greens from where I buy my Christmas tree, which is Home Depot, and <laughs> right, and I get some greens, and I just like wrap them up with some wire, and I make a a wreath and they just sit there. And the wreath lasts like the whole advent. You don't have I mean you could buy one, sure. Right. You know, have a plastic one or something, but we just make one. And then when you you light them on Sunday, you don't light them during the week though. You can light them during the week. You absolutely can. Yeah, you, you absolutely can. Um, I mean we do. We, we we basically have them lit at like dinner time and stuff when we're actually in the room. We have cats <laughs> and now two dogs. And it's anyway my house is like no one's ours. It's horrible. But the cats would definitely light themselves on fire. <laughs> I've seen it happen. <laughs> when I was growing up, one of our cats lit, lit his tail on fire. On the candle. It was a like, <laughs> tore across the house and the tail on fire. <laughs> it's terrible. Bad. Very bad. Very bad. And everything was fine. You lived and then nothing burned down. But you can imagine. There are in the, it's not in the Book of Common Prayer, it's in the Book of Occasional Services, there's a, like, a different blessing for each of the candles. Um, I, I mean, if you're into that sort of thing, you know. I don't, you, I don't use them, I just, I, I know that there are things like that available in the world. Um, okay, let's talk about practicing it. I think it's kind of like, a, like one of those soldiers or whatever. Uh, okay. So, the... Um, Jesus said, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And Isaiah 58 says, Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice so not to share your food with the hungry? The, the best, in my opinion, the best practice, personal practices of Advent are secret acts of righteousness. To me, that's what I think. Um, because they are kind of fasting, and I'm going to talk about fasting a little bit. They are kind of fasting, and they help us identify with the poor. So both of those things at the same time. To me, that's like the greatest, you know, um, way to way to practice Advent on a personal level. Um, in in um, Matthew's Gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has this really interesting. Um, talk about spiritual disciplines. And in his talk about spiritual disciplines, there are three spiritual disciplines that he assumes that all people practice. And the reason he assumes that is because they're, like, in the Middle East, they are entirely 100% common spiritual practices. Um, not only for Jews, but for pagans in the time period now, for Muslims. Like, it's just the way things are done. And, and these are the three practices that I um, recommend for Advent, and there's reasons for each one of them. Um, the first one, uh, Jesus says, is when you give. Now, Jesus doesn't command us to give. He just says, when you give. Right? Because it's assumed. Right? It's an assumed practice of, of the Christian person is that we give. So, um, why do we give? Because we need to lack something. Like we, spiritually, physically, need to be in lack and if most of us are not in lack unless we get rid of stuff. Now, some of us are in lack before we get rid of stuff. Okay? And that's, a, I think, a whole other conversation. Okay? But if, you know, if, if we have tons, like most, like most people I know who I hang out with, tons of food, buy basically whatever we need, whatever we need it, basically, like, you know, we put gas in our car, or whatever, then we don't experience much lack. And so giving is a way of, of, of lacking. 
Okay, it's a way of being empty. Um, and giving is not just about money. It can be about time, talent, and energy. Okay, because that stuff we lack too. Um, most people, uh, like the, the wealthier you are, the more your time is value is more valuable than your money. Okay, so like people with a lot of money don't care that much about the cash. I have noticed. Um, I mean, they do, of course, but it's more about their time. And so, and I think that's true of, of a lot of us, that our time is really valuable to us. And so giving of your time. People say, well, I'm too busy. I'm like, exactly. That's the whole reason to give the time is because you are too busy. And now you have to lack something, right? Because the thing about lack is that it uh, produces in us dependence upon God. If we don't lack, we don't, like, we don't need God, right? Uh, I think this is actually, th Thomas's opinion, this is why Jesus says it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't think it's, he means because rich people are morally inferior or something. I think what he means is because the richer you are, the less you experience a need for God, because the less you lack. And therefore, it's really hard to enter the kingdom of heaven if you're just sort of like, I've got everything I need, and I don't need a God. You know, so makes sense. So that's what we give. So giving time, talent, and energy, giving money. Like giving money is an important part of, of giving. Now, this is the like probably the only place where Advent and uh, secular Christmas happen at the same time is giving money away. Right? You all have Giving Tuesday. Did you have like a, I had a bajillion emails in my inbox. <laughs> Like I said on Twitter, I have no idea why the University of Texas at Austin, which has a $23 billion endowment, asked me five times for money on Giving Tuesday. I'm like, seriously, guys? I've never given them any money. Never a penny. I'm like, no. Anyway, but they keep asking me for money. Um, okay, because the, the culture also realizes that this is a good time to give. It's, good, it's a good time for nonprofits. But it's also a good time to give money to like just people. Like, people that you know who need money. You know, it's like, a, it's a great time to like put a hundred dollars in an envelope and stick it in their mailbox or whatever. I mean, whatever it is you do, it's a good time to like tip the guy who like picks up your trash and your, your mailman and your maid or your whatever, you know, or the lady who waits on you at Wal uh, Waffle House or whatever it is you do. Like, this is just a good time for that, right? Because it's a way for, for you and me to lack something and then to feel like, oh, I don't have enough money. That's awesome, you know? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, another way to do that is through what, like alternative gifts. When I'm what I'm talking about is when you give somebody at Christmas time instead of giving them like a tie, you give them I I donate fifteen dollars to World Vision for you know a goat for you instead of giving them like an actual thing. I think that's really wonderful. I, I think it's I think it's kind of not great to do that to little kids very much. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I would hate to be the little kid who's like. My Christmas, they gave goats to poor people. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I'm, yeah, maybe one goat, but not the whole thing. But uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea for adults, <laughs> you know? Um, I just think that Christmas should be nice for children. Um, I see I'm not so scroogey. All right. Jesus says, when you pray, um, once again, he doesn't command us to pray in this passage. He just assumes that we pray because in his world, everybody prayed, right? Like, it's just what you do, you just pray. And so, when you pray, uh, the purpose of prayer in an Advent season, hopefully, maybe in all seasons, is powerlessness. Is to get in touch with your powerlessness. Because here's the thing, if you're praying and asking God for stuff, it's because you recognize that you can't get it. Okay? Like, if I'm asking God to heal Roy Gullman, it's because I can't heal Roy Gullman. So I'm acknowledging, my prayer by definition acknowledges my powerlessness. Right? So if I'm not praying, it's probably because I don't feel powerless. You know, if, my prayer life, if I don't have much of a prayer life, it's probably because I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I got it, I'm good. You know, it's people who are in need who start to pray. <laughs> I don't know, have you ever noticed this in your own life? You know, it's like, it's like when, you, when they diagnose, you know, your loved one with cancer, that's when you really start praying. <laughs> right? It's because you acknowledge your powerlessness. All right, so that's what it does. Prayer acknowledges powerlessness, and powerlessness is an important Advent um, discipline. 
to get a hold of. Because that's what this is one of the ways we re get ready for Jesus, is we recognize that we're powerless. It's like, oh, here he comes. <laughs> right? It's not like, oh, here he comes, cool. What's up, Jesus? It's like, oh, here comes Jesus. I'm powerless. I got nothing over here. So um, I encourage personal prayer, like focus on your personal prayer during Advent, whatever that means to you. Um, I think it, because it's personal, it is personal. Um, if you would like to talk about personal prayer, like you can talk to me or Kenny or lots of people who go to this church anytime, like literally anytime you want to make an appointment, we'll talk to you about your personal prayer life and how you can, you know, step more into prayer. And like, I, literally, that's my job. I do it all the time. So, if you want to talk about personal prayer, um, corporate prayer and worship. I mean, I think that Advent, I kind of say this, I think it's a good time to go to church, you know, during Advent to like get up and be like, oh, yeah, it's really dark and cold outside, so I should go to church. Because right? it's Advent. January, blow it off. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but I'm every day good time. And then I think the pr prayer of silence is really important. I think silence is really important generally for people, especially in our, our age. Um, but a prayer that is just being silent before God, not asking for anything or talking or tr even listening, really, just being silent. Um, is really helpful because it's a that's a prayer of powerlessness too. Like silence is a silence is uncomfortable in part because of its because we have no power over it. You know, so we want to fill it up with things. Okay. So pray. We need pray. And then the last one that Jesus assumes is fasting. Um, when you fast, once again, Jesus doesn't command us to fast, he just says when you fast. Because in the because <laughs> in the ancient world Fasting was a normal procedure of life. Okay? That's what people did. Fasting has made a huge comeback in America. This may be another way of it. Fasting is now a thing. What, who knew, right? People are fasting, but they're doing it for health reasons, but also for spiritual reasons. People are recognizing the spiritual aspects of fasting, which I think is great. Ten years from now, they'll stop doing it, and they'll do something else, and we'll hopefully still be fasting. But, cool, good for you, culture. Uh, Fasting is important in Advent because hunger is a kind of a lack and a kind of a powerlessness. Right? Hunger identifies with the poor. Because the poorest, well, the poorest in America, unfortunately, have tons of food. Um, in the sense of the, the working poor in America are like the most likely to be obese because of the way that food is structured. Right? But historically, and certainly around the world, hunger and poverty go hand in hand. Right, these two things definitely go together. And so fasting is a way of identifying with the poor. Because we feel hunger. Um, and therefore we're like, oh, this is what it's like. It's actually not what it's like because we're actually are in control and we can eat later, you know? Um, it, it must be completely different. I don't know from experience, but it must be completely different to be hungry and not know when you're not gonna when you're really eating. It must be a horrible, horrible feeling. Um, but that helps us to identify. Uh, with the poor. Um, the fasting can be, um, fasting, food is the first thing, <laughs> right, about fasting. Um, and just like in Lent, some people in Advent fast a thing, <clears throat> alcohol, chocolate, video games, whatever it is you think. Um, and then some people fast like, oh, okay, on Wednesdays I'm not going to eat lunch. Okay, cool. Or whatever it is you want. There's no there's no prescribed thing that you have to do or something. There's no law. It's just fasting is a, is a good idea. Um, so take so fasting is also about taking in um, taking less in and not just food, right? It might be about taking in less television, or it might be about taking in less whatever you know, whatever it is that that you fill up your day with. Like it may be about taking in less of that. Um, it can also be about giving less in, in the idea of spending, right? Spending less money, giving less to people who don't need what, all the things you're giving, you know, like, you know, it, it can be about that too. Because once again, I would say it's about hunger and intentionally entering a place of hunger, which we don't usually do um, unless we fast as a normal part of our lives. Um, entering into a, a, a place of hunger is a is always a good spiritual discipline. Uh, now, there are people, I should definitely say this, there are people who should not fast physically. Um, and 
those two kinds of people are uh, people who have a, a medical condition like diabetes type 1. Like that's a pretty bad idea if you're a type 1 diabetic, so whatever. And also people who struggle with eating disorders um, because it's a very quick trip from I'm fasting for Jesus to eating disorder bill. So do not spiritualize your eating disorder by doing anything with Jesus. It's a terrible idea. Okay? Um, and I know it's much harder than how I just said it to you. Um, okay. So. And then finally, <laughs> joy. Um, the, the thing about hunger and lack and powerlessness is that it gives um, the Lord the opportunity to be, the, to be in charge of our lives and to meet our needs. See, that's the thing. It's like, that's, why, that's ultimately why fasting, it's ultimately why giving, it's ultimately why praying, so that you can encounter God in your life and be filled with his joy. Like, that's, that's what we're headed for here. Okay? So, like, just like Advent, the purpose of Advent is to prepare for Christmas. Right? The purpose of Lent is to prepare for Easter. Okay? So, the purpose of this is not just to be like, oh, man, I am dour. Awesome. You know, <laughs> like it's not that. It's not pain for the sake of pain or like some kind of like glorification of like self flagellation or whatever. But rather it's preparing for joy because the more, like, not, it's not, a, I was about to say something that sounded arithmetic, I don't mean. Um, but as I am in lack, I then find God to be fruitful. And I'm more, I am more thankful. When I lack something, then I'm more thankful for what I have. When I'm hungry, I'm more thankful for the food I'm given. Like, all that kind of stuff. Like, there's a gratitude, and there's a joy that comes with having lack and not having what you need and not having enough money and all that kind of stuff because you've given it away. Right? Um, so, joy. Like, Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, right? Because that whole passage, which is the, like, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Like Jesus just said, okay, you need to fast, you need to pray, you need to give, don't worry about tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow will take care of itself. Your Heavenly Father needs you, knows you need everything. Focus on His kingdom and His righteousness. Everything else will be added to you. Right? So He's like, give stuff and then focus on the kingdom and you'll, receive, and you'll get what you need. Okay? Not by that I mean a new car. I mean, you'll get what you need. You know, and it's a new car. But that's not really so finding your security in God's kingdom and righteousness is like, that's where we're headed here. That's the purpose. Um, but it does, it, it requires some kind of lack. My, my experience is that every Christian is going to enter darkness. And the question will be, the only question is, am I entering darkness because I've just chosen to or because my circumstances have brought me to it? And I feel like if I don't choose it, my circumstances will definitely bring it to me. And then, if I do choose it, I will still have darkness brought to me in my circumstances. But at least I'll know how to deal with it. You know, at least I'll know, I'll be like, oh, it's darkness, my old friend. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, being aware of darkness is a really good idea. Because you're going to have it. So, enter it in a controlled way. Advent or Lent. And then when it's uncontrolled, at least you'll have to be prepared or more prepared than you were otherwise. Um, okay. So um, here at Good Old Church of the Redeemer, um, I encourage you to come on Sunday mornings. Like I said. Uh, next week, one of our Advent things that we do every year is we have Story Night, which is a lot of fun. So maybe it's Christmas, yeah, I don't know, but it's fun, and that happens not in this room, but in that room on, on Wednesday night. Next week, 6.30 is when we start. Um, Wednesday. Oh, I was going to say, there's not a, there's supposed to be a little other dot. Okay, so um, another thing you could, might consider is we do offer uh, Eucharist at noon on Wednesdays in this chapel, and that, there's always somebody here. <laughs> there are always a couple lay people here. But, but Advent is a good time for that, if you have time in the middle of the day to come over here. Um, it may be a good way to make some time for that. 
you know, to say like, oh, I'm going to knock off work for 30 minutes and go over there. Or how long it takes you to get here? Uh, the pageant is a completely non-advent experience that you must experience. And that is not this Sunday, but next Sunday. With the third, so it's the third Sunday of Advent. It's the pink one. It's Heaven Sunday, right? And so we're going to have um, a choir of adult. We have an adult choir. And they have handbells, apparently. I know. Really? I know. And then, and then the kids are doing their thing. And this year there's a child dressed as a star. And there's another child, I think, dressed as, I can't remember who it was. It may be Wonder Woman. Because one of the kids was like, I would like to dress as Wonder Woman. And Mary Kate was like, okay. You know? <laughs> Whatever. Maybe a Wonder Woman hybrid sheep. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, Christmas Eve around here is begins with music at 10 p.m. On, on the 24th. And then the liturgy starts at 10.30. So we're out by midnight. So it's midnight mass, but very, very uh, vaguely. Um, and then Christmas, that we have a Christmas Day service at noon. Um, some people ask me, like, why don't you have a, like a family Christmas Eve service? Like, in other words, for kids. And I say, that's what Christmas Day is. Like, a lot of people bring their bring children on Christmas Day. It's a pretty, it's actually a pretty large service. It's not, the first time I did a Christmas Day service, seven people showed up. And now it's like way over 100 people show up. It's crazy. Fun, you know? Um, and like a lot of little kids and stuff. So it's great. Um, and that's because Chris, <laughs> Christmas is a feast of the church and we have to celebrate <laughs> on Christmas. It's not a day to stay home with your family. I mean, it is, but it's not also, it's also a holy day. It's not just a, a family day. So anyway, that's where we get at. So um, that's on the 25th. So I encourage you to, uh, to come to that. So anyway, let, like I say, next week is story night. I hope that some of you will come to that. It's a lot of fun. Questions, comments about Advent? What are some other differences between Advent and Lent, just to characterize them as being different? Um, if this were about Lent, I'd be talking a lot more about self-examination mm -hmm. than I am. Um, Lent is very specifically non-celebratory. So, like, we don't use the word hallelujah during Lent in the, in the liturgy, for instance. Um, Lent is a... Lent, Lent only gets darker as you go through it. Advent gets brighter and Lent gets darker. So that, like, Good Friday is the darkest thing you can imagine. You know? And that's where Lent goes before it turns. And so it's, like, it's different in that sense, too. And so I think, um, yeah. And also, we say, uh, there's a, so one of the things we, we say is we say um, the fourth Sunday of Advent, the third Sunday of Advent. But we say the third Sunday in Lent. The fourth Sunday in Lent. Because Sundays are not in are not Lenten. You can't have because Sunday is a day of resurrection and Lent is a day of is a time of darkness. And you can't have them both at the same time. You can have Advent, the darkness of Advent, and Sunday Eucharist at the same time. But you can't have Lent. You fully Lent and fully Eucharist on Sunday at the same time. So it's the Sundays. So Sundays don't count. For Lent, mm -hmm. when you do the forty days, Sundays don't count because it's the fourth Sunday in Lent, not the fourth Sunday of Lent. And the rest of the year, it's up the fifth Sunday of Easter, the twelfth Sunday after Pentecost, or whatever it is. We're around Pentecost. So, good question. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I'm glad you were able to come. Have a dark and foreboding Lent. Or <laughs> <laughs> dark and foreboding. <laughs> 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 <laughs>